Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we have with us Manny Nijar. He's the founder and CEO of True, which is a very interesting company that has been around for three years and working on how to solve healthcare problems with self-sovereign identity. This will be a very exciting talk, but before we go into the deep things about Manny will be telling us about, let us go to slide number two, where I quickly review with you what SSI Meetup is about. Basically, what we're trying to do here is empower global SSI communities this is open to everyone. So please, if your company is just someone interested in general or an association or anything, just reach out. Um, happy to talk with you. And all the content um, you will be seeing here um, is a creative comments by share like license, which basically means it's an open source license that allows you to download later on once we publish this um, the Google slides so you can reuse them. But, and it also allows you to reuse them with that license where, where you only have to say that this came from, in this case, from True, from Manny, and by as, uh, with SSI Meetup, and then you will be able to you, you reuse this material. We have 20 other webinars we've did before. Um, please check them out where you have all kinds of subjects that we're covering. Today is one of the first times where we're covering one of the use cases, which I find really exciting, because usually we talk about technology and the different shapes and flavors of technology or legal aspects. But today we, we have a real use case and with someone who knows this space really well, because he has been working on this problem for three years and is really excited about it. Um, for any questions that you might have during the presentation, please just write it into the um, questions field and I'll be bringing up those questions to many. And Manny, it's great to have you with us here today and I really look forward to hear what you have to say and share with us. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, uh, hi, everyone. So uh, my name is uh, Manreet Nijar. I'm a physician uh, trained in the UK. Um, and uh, I just wanted to start with, with this statement, um, which I'll, I'll let you read. I'm, I'm not going to read it out. I'll give you a couple of seconds. So I honestly believe this so much so I um, I took a break from my career in medicine uh, three months ago. So after 18 years of trading, all all the nights, hard work, um, got to the top of the tree and thought, you know what, this is this technology can actually impact millions of lives. Um, so I, I gave that all up to see if we could make a difference. Um, so. Oh, today's webinar, I'll just be going over my personal journey um, and what problem I try to solve. And, and it's a personal problem um, when I was I was working um, and it's just under four years ago. And I'll go through that. And then just examples of some national and global issues uh, with healthcare workforce, because so, that's a specific use case we're working on. And then the solution we've created for doctors in the UK, but could be used uh, more widely around, around the world. Um, where we are in terms of what we've achieved to date um, and where, where we're going uh, in terms of the roadmap, in terms of opportunities and, and delivering um, real world uh, solutions. Um, uh, and then following on from that, I actually, We'll talk about why I think SSI are the foundations of future healthcare ecosystems and, and networks. And I think it's, it'll be should be pretty obvious um, to the people I'm speaking to. But we'll go through uh, the ecosystem, the different players, and then just in some example use cases in terms of why you'd need to know someone's identity and what that would uh, enable. And then lastly, it's a, it's a concept that I'm not sure has been spoken about, but it's something that came to my mind, and I'm sure someone might have thought of this before, but it's something called trust waterfalls, lakes and ocean. And it's just the way I I put the whole trust uh, in context from what I've learnt in the physical world as a doctor, but how this could apply in the adoption uh, of SSI in the, in this digital world and how, how we could leverage it. And then, um, as Alex said, I'm, I'm happy to take questions um, throughout, but if you want to wait to the end, we can have some time at the end to answer some questions. Um, and I'm happy for it to be an interactive um, session. I might not know all the answers, but I'd be happy to uh, find out or 
point you guys into the direction or maybe figure something out together. Um, so early beginnings. Um, for me, this is this is my granddad. Um, so he was basically my best friend and he's actually my inspiration to, to why I became a doctor. So I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, so he, he was born in India. Um, and actually, I, I'll see if I get the point here. He was born in an area here. And, and in 1930, he moved across to uh, Kenya. Um, so he'd, he'd have to get, a, I think, a five day train down to Bombay. Um, oops, and then a, a, from there, and then a 10 day boat across to East Africa. And he went back and forth. Um, he initially worked on the railways there, then became a mechanic. Um, my dad was born there, and I was born in Kenya myself. And then at the age of five, he um, got diagnosed with colonic cancer and then we moved over to the UK um, and he died um, at the age of eight. Um, and that's when I decided I wanted to, to become a doctor. But bigger than that, on, and I, I give Alex and the SSI team uh, thanks and, because it's actually given me time to reflect on why have I actually, why am I actually doing what I'm doing? And one of my inspirations was, he kind of proved to me that you can achieve anything. Um, and I actually think as a, as a community, we can really achieve something special with SSI and especially in healthcare because it's, it's such an emotive subject. Um, and we have the opportunity for technology to drive something to do the, do the right way. Um, so I came to the UK, I went to study um, at Liverpool University which is one of the original red uh, brick universities in the UK. So that's the Victoria building. The journey wasn't easy. I was told by my biology teacher in secondary school, I'd never become a doctor. Um, um, and she told me not to apply, but I applied anyway. Um, and I got in eventually. Um, and then I, I chose to do infectious diseases, um, a speciality in the UK, which is quite competitive. And at, at the time I applied, there was only four jobs in the country and again I was told you won't get in and and I got in so so these are kind of things that actually kind of makes you believe that if if you passionately believe in something and you really want to do it you 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 can achieve it and I chose infectious diseases I don't know if you can see there but the reason I chose it is you can see how communicable diseases are, affect a lot of India sub-Saharan Africa um, and uh, South America and so it's, it's something personal from from my point of view in terms of I've got healthcare is for me is a, is a global need and I'm in a privileged position that I can impact people that I can see on a day to day basis here in the UK. But hopefully what I'd love to do is try and bring some global healthcare uh, impact with with technology as, as the driver. So that's. A little bit about me and how I became a doctor and why I chose infectious diseases. So fast forward uh, eight years of, of being a doctor um, and so this is in 2015 um, and in the UK there was a, a big shortage of doctors um, and there was a lot of money being spent on third party agencies to kind of fill fill gaps and and that was personal to my story and I'll come on to that in a, sec in a second but amongst that there was also um, in the background there was junior doctor contract negotiations with the government in terms of doctors feeling disempowered having to work longer hours not safe um, not getting paid as well and so you were, you were, you had this for doctors who were working full time then you had these agency doctors who were getting paid a lot more um, and so this came ahead in March 2015 for myself. I was working in a thousand bedded hospital in the south of uh, England. Um, and so I was the senior physician on site. So I was looking after 400 uh, beds and then that included 10 high dependency beds. So there were 10 patients who, who, who needed ventilation and I was looking after that but I also covered the other 600 surgical patients if needed but they normally had their home teams so one of these teams I think the orthopedic ward had one of these agency doctors who came in and was basically not safe to practice was putting patients at, 
at danger and then I was getting called taken away from my patients to try and either pick up what he had or hadn't done and the issue at this point was I would try and report that back but the mechanisms weren't in place and when I did the hospitals were like well we need the agencies because we've got so much shortage we can't we need we re re rely on them so we can't um cut cut that agency um this doctor was getting paid five times more than me which was even more demoralizing because a he was he was putting patients at risk taking more resource away and causing more problems and you're working all hours god sense and, you, and you're not getting any recognition so you can see there was this this was, there was something there that could either be done. I was on the verge of either quitting medicine or trying to do something, and that's where, where my journey journey began. What I'd like to point out here, though, is I, I, I don't blame that doctor per se, because equally, I don't think he knew exactly what he was going into. He could have just turned up and obviously he has bills to pay and he might have not known what job he was going into. So you, you don't make assumptions on that. But ultimately, it's it's the patients who who are your main priority. So what we did was, we decided to uh, create a matching platform where we thought we could cut out these third party agencies, um, and you have a hospital and you have a doctor, and they could kind of match, maybe like an Uber. But very early on, I kind of then focused on why the agencies had the supply, and they used to do the identity checks. So. That's when I kind of realized it's not the matching platform that really matters. It's how do we give a trusted digital identity so you actually know that doctor next to you is credentialed because the the checking that the agencies were doing, which I went through myself, weren't standardized. They were very quick and they they just the main concern was to trying to get you out and ship you out out to hospitals. So that was a problem in terms of how do you have assurances of the doctors you're working with now this is an ongoing problem and these are just stories from the uk in the last 18 months that and it just this only took me five minutes so there was a fake psychiatrist who'd been practicing look at the dates november 2018 um there's a paramedic who treated more than a, a thousand patients um um surgeon lying in terms of his his job in terms of what skills he could do um there's a piece on this from someone who actually worked within the industry who realized there's more fake fake doctors than you actually realize which is quite scary and that was just from august 2017. another doctor managed to uh, <laughs> defraud the nhs from 350,000 pounds um, and that was again from November 2018. This is what the British Medical Journal reported. They've they've had to check over 3,000 doctors' credentials, and um, because of that fraudulent psychiatrist. And it and it's not just a problem. It's not just a problem in the UK. It's it's also a problem in America. And if you haven't if you haven't heard this podcast, I'd I'd recommend it. So. Um, and, and the links there at the bottom. This is basically an amazing podcast, which is about a, a doctor in America. He was, he was a neurosurgeon and he actually, there was no system in place to check his credentials or, or he could move from hospital to hospital. And he ended up killing 33 people and um, causing uh, damage irreversible damage to 30 other patients, including paralysis and lifelong pain. So that really, really hit home in terms of what, why I became a doctor is I made some promises. And, and the first promise we, we make when we qualify as a doctor is we, we take the Hippocratic Oath or, or the Declaration of Geneva, which is, which is the more common thing. And for me, I, I, I focus on on number, well, all, all of it. So in terms of service of humanity, but number three, is the health and well-being of my patients, my first consideration. And that that is a driver for me to to carry on doing what I'm doing right now. Um, and so I, I morally couldn't understand that these things were happening and the system wouldn't let you do anything because 
the system was like, no, we can't. It was broken. And so how can we try, maybe not fix it, but hopefully make it better? And that's why I um, I started this journey of, of SSI um, in healthcare. So the, the problem isn't just for the agency doctors who are moving. It's it's more common as well as in terms of pre-employment administration burdens. So doctors who are trading in the in the UK um, can rotate uh, from positions every three, four, six or 12 months. And calculations are about 25,000 doctor days are spent just on uh, physical pre-employment checks. Um, and that's only for 50,000 50, of the 280,000 doctors in the UK. So you can multiply that um, in terms of time wasted on pre-employment checks. Um, and doctors just want to start looking after their patients. They don't, they don't want to be sat, sat in an HR office. They want to be uh, doing what they were trained for. Um, and the numbers quickly add up. So that's 25,000 doctors. If the doctor sees eight patients a day, that's 400,000 patients not seen. That's a delay of care. That's another night in hospital. That's adverse outcomes, um, and it, it just becomes really easy how it how it builds up as a a financial, but also as a healthcare outcomes based thing. When patients are staying in hospital longer, at risk of picking up infections, delayed delays of treatment, short staff, because we haven't got the processes and systems in place to to do things more efficiently or at a higher level of trust. So moving on to the, the global picture. Now, this was an executive summary that was released by the WHO. Um, and it, it shows that there's going to be a 13 million uh, deficit of skilled health professionals by 2035. So the need for training doctors or nurses and midwives is, is going to increase. So there's a, going to be a greater dependence on on technologies and, and we're seeing great advancements in AI um, but how are the remote health and and how are these how do we use these new technologies to create new models of care but how do we transfer that physical trust you have when you meet a doctor you get to know them you can take cues how do you bring that into a digital world how do you not compromise this trust because you're doing everything. And we know that this was a, a article just published in TechCrunch this week was that it is um, projected that um, physical uh, visits to doctors are gonna reduce and look at the rise of the virtual doctor. So the remote healthcare is gonna just exponentially rise in the next 10, 10 years. And, but we need to have the systems where you can actually trust who that other person is on the other line of, of a phone call or a telehealth or an email exchange or over a platform. And frankly, at the moment, I, I don't think this, the, the systems are, are there at the moment to do this. And I think this is a great opportunity for SSI um, to actually add great value to enable these new models of care to have an impact. Um, on a, on a big global health issue in terms of healthcare worker shortage. So that's basically my personal story, what the national picture in the UK was and what, what the global position is in, in terms of, and these are just a few examples. Of that. Um, so what we've been working on, so a decentralized identity for doctors. So what does it look like when, when people ask me? And, and actually this is it. So this is my decentralized identity I, um, and this is from a purely physical point of view i i have been issued all those identification documents and i hold them myself so for me i'll, I'll go through it as as a doctor we we have to show our passport our driving license there you can see my license to practice my university degree i've got to have two proofs of address from a council tax and a bank statement there's my certificate that I'm a physician, and then there's another certificate that I'm a specialist in uh, infectious diseases. This is not all of them. There's other certificates I've, I've gathered on the way that I, I'm 
proficient in advanced life support um, and there's other teaching courses and other, other skills I've, I've gained through uh, portfolios. Now we have to produce these physically all the time um, and we can lose it. So I've lost there is my occupational health which gives my status in terms of my hepatitis B, C and HIV. Obviously I've lost that because it was in a piece of paper so I need to go then get another injection which is not pleasant for me but then the cost associated with that in terms of the hospital having to process it going through the analyzers whereas if I could have stored that or if that's somewhere that I've, I'm held so you could blame the doctor myself but I know I won't lose my phone um, but I might lose these pieces of paper so we move from there to a digital uh, decentralized identity and this is a solution we've created so we we've created a a a digital uh, wallet um working with actually uh, sovereign and Evanim. we're using the connect.me app just to show it but it shows that we've created the different ecosystems so we've got a physical to digital identity provider we've got a licensing authority a couple of hospitals and a university medical school and we're, we're showing although the technology is important one of the real important things is actually putting in a governance system a a domain specific trust framework which will we are creating to allow these different entities to trust each other building on a lot of processes which there's policy documents already out there for but the technology gives them security because there's an auditability and accountability now that previously they couldn't really get into or have the time to um, argue in terms of liability models or, or just didn't have the time because they were so busy trying to do other things within the hospital and so we've got that for the doctor and then for the actual organizations themselves we've we've created a hub where you can actually just issue and verify the credentials and it's a very easy interface where you can request what you need from the doctor um, and you can uh, also issue them credentials if they've worked for you, for example, if they've worked for six months. And that's helpful in terms of the doctor death case. I said you could potentially ask the doctor to show all the credentials issued to them. Or if he puts a CV, then you could ask the issuing authority to issue his credential and they've got a log for it. So. Once you solve the pre-employment problem, what next? So logins, this is, I would say less than half, maybe a third of just my medical logins. Um, and that's not even including logins into the actual portal and the other emails. And I, I really don't want to be logging in with Facebook or <laughs> because we know what they might do with my data and actually my, my data might be of some value if I'm looking at what my prescribing habits or, or looking at some of the metadata. So the next step and evolution of this is how do we how do we help doctors with this problem? How do we save them time waiting um, and logging in? And there's a there's a governance issue here as well because a lot of doctors I know we, we will sign in and so we have in the UK we have some smart cards that we just leave in a computer because it, and you can prescribe off that or you can look at stuff and all that is tracked but you don't know who the end user is because it takes so long to take the smart card out and then put a new smart card in when you just want to go and see a patient and everything loads up so these are real end user problems so if we create a self-sovereign identity for a doctor from their pre-employment check we think could this be the art of possible where you could have a passwordless login where potentially the login system is issued when you click login it asks for you a proof and the organization has already given you a credential to give you access for that and then once you send it you could hopefully log in so that's some pieces of work we're actually starting to look at now. We're, re we're really focused on the pre-employment piece, but we're also looking at, at this, this piece more broadly to see how we could help in terms of could we make the physician's life easier so they can get on with, with looking after the patient.
So where we are at the moment, so we have completed a discovery and proof of concept with the NHS. Um, we are now doing some pre-pilot work um, in terms of business mapping processes and policy uh, documentation um, and in terms of technical architecture, uh, what to be solutions would be at both a local and national level and how these systems would interplay and we're hopefully going to use that 80 to 100 doctors uh, towards uh, the summer or end of the year to to, to pilot this out with. Uh, we basically, I issued, got issued all my credentials on my phone, There's a, I've got a video of it uh, by one hospital going through current standards and then another hospital 100 miles north uh, managed to, to verify my my credentials although I, I went in person with them but it just we, we cut down time significantly just by doing that ourselves is true we became the first founding sovereign in the UK um, which was exciting um, we're just about to do a proof of concept in terms of working with some doctors in rural Bangladesh to try and issue them some credentials and then see if we can do some sort of uh, telehealth link up between two doctors in Bangladesh and the UK just to kind of demonstrate the potential use of, of crossing barriers in, in terms of places of need. So if there's an outbreak or if they needed some expertise, how could we facilitate that with existing technologies? Um, there's a big need for this. So we're getting opportunities from the Middle East, New Zealand, USA, Australia, and this is a mix of actually governmental organizations and, and private organizations who want, who want to partner with us. Um, and, and finally, we, we want to um, be part of the open source community. We, we've uh, just joined up to the Decentralized Identity Foundation um, and we want to contribute because we don't think we can do this alone. Um, but equally, we don't think the big players can do it themselves because it's not their end user need. So I think it's it's a hybrid and a combination of everyone working together to 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 make us achieve something uh, really special. So now I'll just quickly talk in terms of of the ecosystem and the healthcare ecosystem, and we've kind of I've, we've looked at it in terms of individuals, organisations. And things. So, so this kind of, and this is not, this is not a completely inclusive list. This is just what I've thought of in terms of, and it's it's so vast. But I think I've tried, I've got in the, the main ones. So, you can break break them down. As you can see, individuals come from patients always first, but then also uh, family members, caregivers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, scientists. Organisations vary from hospitals, both public and private, regulatory bodies pharma industry, insurers, um, emerging tech platforms like big data and AI, how do they know that the data that's been processed or collected has been by someone trusted? And, um, and then moving into things, we all talk about clinical IoT wearables, but actually we've got stuff like drugs are things and actually a consent process is a thing or an actual clinical trial is a is a thing and, and 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 whole genome sequencing and all these things how how do we identify and interact with all these things because any indiv within each column you're going to interact with each other but across columns you're going to interact with it with each other and so this is why i think ssi is, is so fan foundational because at the moment we can't create a um, trusted peer-to-peer -peer relationship and self-sovereign identity, hopefully, if done correctly, will allow the, us to do this. Now, this diagram hasn't come across. Um, I think it was, it was slightly better on my PowerPoint, I think, when it got converted to Google Slides. But the idea is you can see how all the connections are. So you could create any use case. And I, I can just talk through two or three now, and, I can, I, and we can just follow the flow. So, for example, a, a patient a patient might go to their family doctor and has been there for years with asthma and then goes to their specialist maybe once a year with the asthma then has a flare and they sign to the CHR but this doctor can't get it because they don't know who it is. Now in the self-sovereign world potentially the patient could control their EHR, they give access to the doctor to write here, then it goes back and then they give consent to this doctor who can go and check this. 
then they come in, they get recorded on a medical device owned by the hospital um, and they can collect that. Um, and then they will give consent to a pharmaceutical company to use that data to help make a drug which will benefit them. And so this kind of just goes on. You could then do, here's a collaborative effort that pharmaceutical companies are trying to create a drug with a scientist or a researcher around the world who might be at this academic institution. And that academic institution might have already had a trial where they've enrolled patients and then they kind of fill a, a loophole instead of re-recruiting and wasting money. Um, and what they could learn from, from these results could be shared with hospitals. The, it goes on and on. So if we can get SSI in and you can trust who's on the other end of that connection, it will hopefully allow data to flow better or allow people to trust each other. An example I, I use from my personal practice is when I was a physician, I, I specialized in, in TB and HIV. And so these are HIV, especially the stigma is not there as much, but it's quite a sensitive subject to some people. So some of your clinical colleagues would be, well, how have you got that information to get to that diagnosis? And it was a very simple thing is you build up a relationship. And once someone trusts you, they give you more data, which helps you get to a diagnosis quicker. So the value of the relationship and the trusted relationship is a lot greater than just hoarding and collecting as much data, which you have to filter through and process because that processing power I don't think is worth it. Whereas if you build a relationship and someone trusts you, they give you more information. And, and how do we facilitate that in this healthcare ecosystem? And, and how, how, will we, how will we be able to do that? And I think SSI will, will be the foundations of this. It's not all of it, it's, it's one component, but I think it's an essential component. And I think it's a component where we can actually make a big difference into how, in healthcare if we do it right. So I'll come on to, to my last slide in, in or one of my last couple of slides in terms of I've come up with this concept in terms of trust waterfalls. Um, and what I mean by trust waterfalls is as a doctor, we uh, get validated or accounted for by maybe 10 organisations. So in the UK, we're trusted, along with nurses, we're the most trusted profession. I think it's up to about 90, 91% of uh, people surveyed trust doctors as, 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 as a profession. So as, as, as a physician here in the UK, that trust um, puts me in a role, of, a privileged role where actually I have to sign mortgages or I have to, when someone's applying for a passport, I have to, I have to sign that. So in this self-sovereign world, we we see it and one of the use cases we see is if we want to engage with people onto adopting self-sovereign or digital identity we see doctors if we provide doctors with trusted digital identities now if they're a family doctor they could then issue a credential to one of uh, their patients who's been coming for years or if it's in a refugee setting for example if a doctor is working for an ngo they could then issue a, a credential for a stateless refugee, for example, who has a lot of interaction at a refugee camp. So what that then leads to is something in terms of a trust lake. So that receiving individual can then start building up their, their, their credentials because the doctor is the root of trust who's had a root of trust. But what happens is what you don't want here, you don't want this hierarchical, which is classical in medicine, as doctor says patients do. You basically want to create a lake where eventually everyone is equal and peer to peer. So you can the trust level is equal. So if if then this refugee or whoever vouches for someone else because they've got enough credentials or from enough trusted authorities, they could be as equal as as a doctor. But that will depend on obviously societal and cultural um, beliefs and, and where you're doing that. And then as, as it grows, I think, if you get all these lakes going into an ocean, when there's so many people, 
as a lake is very calm and equal whereas oceans are up and down so then there's a system where actually i can choose who i trust because i've got so many more options and some people i'll trust more or someone will offer something else and then this just creates a dynamic ecosystem so initially there's how i see the adoption hopefully will be some from trusted people and authorities going down to others everyone will be peer-to-peer -peer, but then you'll start getting well actually i trust this more there's more value from here as as it develops so that was my my concept of trust waterfalls lakes and and oceans and and you kind of you kind of see that you kind of see that in healthcare it's it's it's, very, it's similar in terms of if you're in a moment of need right or you're dying you're going to trust anything like a waterfall i'll trust you as a doctor if you're not as if you're okay and you you haven't you've got a minor ailment it'll be more of a lake or if it's you know your gp and it's not too bothered i'll be like fine we're equal i, I might listen to her, i might not um whereas in the online community it's an ocean you can just go out there and how do you know you just pick and choose and people read reviews and stuff so it's a it's a really interesting um space and, and concept around ssi I think it's something I'd, I'd like to investigate further um, and be happy to talk about in the community if anyone wants to do any work around it. Um, so finally, I, I, I'll just leave you with uh, three, three quotes. Um, So I, I actually think, as I mentioned earlier, for this to work, we have to work together. It doesn't matter if you're a small SME like us or you're big global organizations, you need to do this for the right reasons. And we've actually got a, a, a chance to do something right now. I think there is a tipping point coming in the next 12 to 18 to 24 months where things can be implemented the right way and can actually really make a, a, a good change for humanity where everyone wins. So there's commercialization benefits for everyone, but actually the end user uh, wins as well. Um, I think in terms of what Charles Darwin says, it's always working together. But the, the last thing I'd like to say in terms of Isaac Newton is I've, I've only seen this by standing or shoulders of giants. I, this is just a problem. And then I've, I've just been around some amazing people in the SSI community who've actually made me think totally different. I've learned so much um, and I'm, I'm, I'm great to be part of it. And I hope we can, as a community, really uh, make an impact on, in healthcare. Um, uh, and this is, uh, we're writing a chapter in a book, um, which I can let Alex talk about, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, because he knows more about it. Happy to do it. Um, and as you know already, um, um, I'm, I'm leading together with Drum and Reed a book about decentralized digital identity that we will be publishing by the end of this year. We're calling it decentralized digital identity for the time being because just it's, it's like a more open border term because not everyone necessarily agrees on what SSI means today, but we will be talking about that in the book too. And the important thing is that Manny and Paul Knowles um, will be doing a chapter in that book about decentralized digital identity in the healthcare industry and, and what this means. And I think, um, and he shared some really good insights about um, upcoming things in that uh, in his chapter of the book. And um, yeah, so that is what it's about. Um, um, I'm happy to take any questions if there's any, Alex, if we've got time. Yeah, we have plenty of questions that have accumulated here. If you want, I'm just going to start shooting with them. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the first question is from Ify. He's asking, how, how are you dealing with GDPR? So at the moment, obviously, in terms of GDPR, um, what the UK healthcare system is, they're trying to solve this problem in terms of streamlining. So at the moment, they're getting doctors to sign waivers. So I'll particularly talk about occupational health in terms of which is personal health information, where they've got a centralized system called, uh, what's it called? Uh, EHR, which is Electronic Health Roster where your occupational health is there, you sign a waiver and then one hospital can share it to another hospital through a centralized system, although all these systems aren't, aren't connected. What we kind of feel is, I think in terms of 
self-sovereign identity kind of lends itself to GDPR. If we if we keep it at a very simple level, we don't use the technology, but if we use the analogy of actually if I have a piece of paper which I hold with my degree or my details, I can show it to you and it's and we can record it. Um, which kind of and and then in terms of from an organizational point of view, they just need to know I'm uh, a doctor um, with a degree who's got the same name on my passport. They don't might not need to know my date of birth. So the, the, there comes a point of actually when they do the request, you can go on to data minimization. Um, and it's an, it's an interesting point. But I think the self-sovereign identity world, in terms of how we look at DIDs and uh, private DIDs not being on, on chain and because they can be accounted as PII. So it's an interesting space. I think the, the concept is what we do in the physical world. Um, it's, it's a lot better than what we have at the, at the moment. And I think conversation has to be had with, with the policymakers actually in terms of GDPR. What was the reason for GDPR? The, the whole reason for GDPR was actually your your, your data was, was being used without your consent. Everyone was collecting it. And I think what we're trying to do is the opposite. And I think we we, we try, we're lending to solving GDPR. Um, so I think it's a complementary solution, but I don't think everything is, is figured out. And I think that's a conversation that I know is, is happening with policymakers at the EU. Um, I, that, that Those are my thoughts on, on GDPR. I, th I think letting the owner hold their credentials and then give permissions. Um, right. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and then the second question we had from IFE is, um, what are the integration requirements for SSI in the healthcare industry? So, so that's an interesting interesting question. So I know some stuff on, so in terms of, let's look at open standards and, and what open standards we've, we've got in the healthcare space. So we've got, we've got HL, HL, HL7 fire as in terms of communication. We've got SNOMED CT in terms of data input structure. So in terms of what integration systems you, you need, what we've come in and we've said to working with the NHS, we, we want to kind of embrace and enable um, existing infrastructure. So in terms of we're trying to create open APIs that people can call from systems to issue and verify credentials we know there's going to be a high there's this transition it's it's not going to be a binary switch to a, a centralized federated system to a full self-sovereign and actually there might be some situations where you people might want to give control and and, and so it's a for me i think self-sovereign identity is an and i don't think it's an or um and i think the integration kind of depends on the systems but we can put up these things as standalone. There is some manual input, and then we're creating APIs where you can we can issue and call credentials. I think as the ecosystems mature and more open standards are, are readily available, um, one of the bigger conversations we're having and looking with the NHS is in terms of who's going to be doing the integration partners, or, or you, are we just going to publish a list of of these things? And if if uh, suppliers don't meet it; they won't get their they won't get renewable uh, contracts. So there is that that is an interesting question. But it's, the NHS in the UK are, are really driving open standards, um, and they don't want any more vendor locking, which again I think the SSI movement lends itself to. Thank you. There's another question from Joaquin. He's asking, can we consider Apple uh, with the devices to be to be a key part of the ocean? Uh, yeah, I suppose I suppose they are, aren't they? Um, look, I think, yes, I think Apple are, would be a key part of the ocean. It depends what they want to do. If there's every, everyone has an Apple, everyone has an Apple phone, who has an Apple phone has a wallet already, which you hold your credit card or your, your passport. Could it hold your digital credentials for me as a doctor? Potentially. Do I trust Apple with healthcare? I would say, I trust them more than the others. Um, and yeah, I think some of the big players, as I said earlier, is this is like an embracing. I think the, the movement, and I know SSI as a movement, we, we kind of look at the big four or five organizations, but I think if we can encourage them to embrace it, and I think they will have to become 
an ocean, but how much of the ocean they want to be will depend on how much they're willing to give up. And so that that is a, that is an interesting question. I need to go and think about that a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, and Joaquin is also asking, what is your vision on having one blockchain or several blockchains interacting to allow the peer-to-peer -peer interactions? Yeah, so for me, um, and I think I spoke to you about this earlier, Alex, is I um, think we should be ledger agnostic. If we're full self-sovereign, I think there needs to be into, into ledger interoperability. I think I think the end user won't really care, but if there is one that does care, they should be able to have an option. For example, if they're holding their credentials and where, where their dids are, are, it could be up to them where it resolves to. So I, 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 I don't, I, I can't see them being hundreds of ledgers, but I think there might be four or five, potentially. So that's where, where we're going. We want to be, we've gone with Sovereign at the moment, but we want to be ledger agnostic in the future. Um, but it's going to be who's got the best government governance and where the most, um, who's going to interoperate with who. Because there's no, the, the thing here is we've really got an opportunity to, to change how things were done in the past because if it's just going to be one ledger potentially then which is it, you could almost create a centralized decentralized um, depending on how that ledger is obviously governed or whether it's public private and all those questions um, so I kind of I, I, I'm moving more towards multiple ledgers with open and interoperable standards Excellent. Um, Joaquin is also asking, um, who are your competitors today, if you have many? Uh, I don't see we have any competitors. I, I'd like to think everyone's a collaborator. As I said in the space, we're we're open to, to partnerships. I I think this is this is bigger than just, and I know this is maybe a commercial question question, but I I think it's such a big pie, especially healthcare. If if you look at the American healthcare system, it's the fifth biggest economy in the world, right? And um, you just do things the right way. Um, at the moment, I I know this in terms of if you're specifically looking at physician credentialing, there are, there are a few companies coming out of America who've got a different model using blockchain. Uh, they're called ProcredX, but they're not self-sovereign. They're basically creating a credential, from what I understand, a credential marketplace uh, where institutions exchange credentials and they monetize it with permission from the physician. Um, which kind of, I, I, I don't know, I potentially almost seems like crypto kitties for doctors without the doctors being involved, but they're the ones who, I, who I'd say um, are, are doing it. Um, but other than that, I, I don't really know anyone else. Okay. Um, Joaquin is also asking, um, where is the doctor-patient's data being stored? So. At, at the moment, in terms of, so the doctor will hold their credentials on their edge device at the moment. Um, and there's this whole debate of cloud agent, edge agent. So in the future, your credentials potentially could be held on a cloud or on an edge agent of, of your device. Um, and this is just for your identity credentials. That's basically where it's going to be held. Then you share those credentials with the organization and the organization can then decide what they want to do with that. If they only... So some of the, the, the framework work we're looking at is actually some organizations need to hold that data for seven years. So potential models we're looking at is actually if the organizations request the credential from the doctor, the doctor sends it across, um, then there's a record that it's, they've, it, it's been sent and seen, they can tick it and then they could delete it if they want. And then there might be in terms of, I don't know, a smart contract or a future agency that says for the next seven years, because you've got a relationship with these organizations on the T and T's and C's, every time they request this thing, you, you might, or agency on, on your behalf will share it. So those are the models. So again, it will be like, what what we're trying to do is what, what do you do is now, but can you minimize that? So if you've got a direct peer-to-peer -peer relationship with that doctor and you know who they are, and there's an agency acting on behalf of that doctor because they trust that hospital, they potentially don't need to hold that data about that doctor. They just need to know where to go and find it. Um, and, and, and that's where we potentially kind of would see the ideal situation moving forward to. Again, I think 
one thing I want to talk about here in the space, but also some stuff from medicine is nothing is black and white and everyone looks at stuff in binary. There's this whole scale of gray and we need to just, you just move along you, case by case. Um, and is it better than what we have at the moment? And can it be better than what we do at the moment? And uh, how do we evolve this? We're not just going to get from zero to to a hundred. We're going to have to go through these steps. And but how do we learn and do it in a controlled and safe manner? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, Lynn is asking: um, Do you envision an SSI gateway access for everyone to the health ecosystem? Again, yeah. So that kind of depends on the individual. Um, Again, yes, ideally, if someone wants to, they should be able to. Um, but some people might not want to, right? We we get fascinated because we're in this space, and I, I've been in this space now three three years, three and a bit years. Um, but you go out and what what's happening in the real world? Do we're we're very passionate about this. Some people might like a centralized solution because it makes their life easier, and they don't really care. Um, but ideally, yeah, if we could create a, a global utility or utilities for people to access this ecosystem, yeah, it should be open. But that, that's more because of my beliefs in I think healthcare is a human right. But then you have to have, you could have ecosystems that might just be private healthcare ecosystems, but you should be able to interoperate between who has access to that and who doesn't. And, and so, these questions are interesting and I don't know. Again, these are things that are gonna to have to play out, but I, I would hope that if anyone wanted to have access to the SSI healthcare ecosystem, they should be able to. Great. We have Jose asking, um, who do you think has to do more steps to embrace SSI as a standard in healthcare institutions or the administration or any other? Again, I think it's a, a collaborative. I think, I think, um, everyone has a role from the end users whether that be the clinicians doctors and patients um the organizations um, and, and the trick with the organizations is you need to show the benefit to them um and especially coming off the whole big data let's collect all data healthcare is traditionally not now but has always been behind finance in terms of technology and stuff so i th i think it's it's a community to drive it because if doctors have this, but organizations don't, then it won't work. But if organizations have the tools and doctors don't want to use it. So you've got to you've got to solve the problem. And that's what we we kind of are solving a problem or solving my own problem. And we're very focused on and it's not just a problem for us. We, we our use case is specific. Every organization we've catered for have said, yes, this is a problem for us. The organization saying we take too much time. All we want to know is we want to trust once we have a doctor, we, we want to trust that they can do their job. And we want to know a way we can record that. The governance and, and medical licensing authorities are like, yeah, we can't keep track of all these doctors because they're working here, there and everywhere. And there's no way for them to receive credentials. There's a piece of paper here or there they can sometimes hide. So. I think it's it's all the players um, have to work together, and it's but it's understanding the individual needs um, as opposed to just dictating it. Great. Um, we have Ifi also asking, how do we protect customer information collaboration mode with overseas doctors? So if SSI does enable the consent from the user, but once consent is granted, how do we protect it? So if so, if consent. So just ask that question again, Alex. Sorry. Yeah, sure. And, and he's asking, how do we protect customer information in collaboration mode with overseas doctors? And then he says, um, if SSI does enable the consent from the user, but, and and once consent is granted, how do we protect it? So if if that's right, is that in terms of consent of sharing data between? would that be two doctors so if there's an overseas doctor and another doctor and is it a triangular relationship where so there's there's, there's two models I, I if i if i'm getting if i get the question right in my head so there's there's two ways you could potentially look at the model is a doctor a has a self-sovereign identity doctor b has a self-sovereign identity and they could be different countries and patient uh, c for example has a self-sovereign identity 
Now, if patient C has access and control over their healthcare records, um, and they can verify who Dr. A is, and Dr. A can write to those healthcare records and, and read and write, um, and patient C goes to Dr. B and gives consent A to communicate, because if, if the user is the holder, then the consent will go straight through the patient. So you've got that triangle. And that's why I, I, sus I suspect SSI will facilitate personal health records. However, if you said it was held in a, uh, in a centralized system where self-sovereign identity only gave you access, um, well, the, the consent will just record the log of I've given consent and then the doctor can go read and write. Um, it's yeah, consent is an in, it is an interesting, interesting, interesting piece because it's quite dynamic, and I know there is some consent solutions out there on, on blockchain at the moment, especially in the UK, um, that that look at it as as not as dynamic, just saying actually I will share this information because you've got to realise what's the benefit to the patient, right? Ultimately. If I'm dying, I'm going to give as much information if I know it's going to save my life. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that's right, but you sh it's, it's what is the real life situation because we can, we can think about it, but unless we try it out, we will, we we'll kind of learn lessons by mapping it out. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I have confession. This is also just related. I mean, I, I'm, I'm reading the question myself about revocation. Like, I mean, you, you can grant. Um, consent, uh, as I is calling it here, to 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 doctor, and just revoked it. I guess, like for like, say, hey, you have access to my data for 24 hours or one week, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, you could timestamp it. I'm sure that the, 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 there would be mechanisms in terms that you could you could timestamp, you could timestamp it. Um, yeah, you can only do it at at this interaction. In terms of at, at, so how how. How a lot of EHR systems now work is it's 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 seen as an episode, so it could just be this current episode or all future episodes. Um, yeah, and that should and I, I would love to move to a world where there's that, that granular consent, but then you've got the danger of consent fatigue, right? And um, mm -hmm. consenting too much, so it's a, it's a balance. And, so, and but then you have to cater to everyone because some people will really care about it, and I think we'd be on the spectrum of full privacy and consent. Um, but what's the right thing for the person? Yeah, in terms of human rights wise. Um, but equally, you don't want to make it too onerous because it's like the same thing, right? You you, you don't read T's and C's, which are loads and loads and loads of pages, right? You just tick it, tick, tick, tick. Yeah. You want to go and do something, right? So if I want to access healthcare or I want it shared, I, what, it, yeah, it needs to be simple, simplified. But depending on the sensitivity of the data, I think it will be important, right? For example, if someone's got HIV, and I only want, and we, and we see this now actually. So with the patients I treat, they don't want their family doctor to know, but you have to explain to them it could actually hinder their care because the family doctor might give a drug that interacts with an HIV medication that they don't know about. And um, so how? And so as long as they know the risks, I think again it's that human element. As long as they're informed and they know the risks and what levels of consent they give. But yeah, I'd 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 like to hope this could move to a granular consent model or facilitate that and I don't know that's maybe five ten years away five or maybe three to five I don't know I, I can't predict <laughs> yeah true and I is also asking like um you mentioned Bangladesh do you think think um, access to healthcare is the main issue or is education one of the main issues to educate people about privacy and sovereignty of their identities so Bangladesh was a really interesting experience. So we went up, we were four hours north of Dhaka and it was this, uh, it's an amazing place called Kalakuri, a health project, which is basically a village, a re one of the poorest villages, which I think has got Muslims, Christians and Hindus working together to provide. So they're really poor, but they get trained up to provide health care for poor who can't afford it. Um, but everyone there had a mobile phone and everyone communicated through Facebook. Um, so, yes, there's an educational piece. But then what's their greater need, right? Is there greater need for the healthcare workers there? One of, one of the, the things the doctors out there said was they've got a really big problem with fraudulent doctors in Bangladesh. Um, 
because there's a because there's a lot of money in it there's a lot of doctors who pretend who are not doctors who pretend they're doctors um and get paid and they go and start prescribing antibiotics and then there's an issue of antibiotic resistant obviously that comes under my infectious diseases specialty so people are giving courses of antibiotic that becomes antibiotic resistance that becomes more of a global health health problem so i think it's a combination of both it's it's education but it, it's the value right so in this poor place their communication value is greater so there everyone's on facebook and they don't really care about their data at the moment whereas if you look at us in the more developed world now we understand what's happening with our data and where the product we care about it right but their need to communicate is greater than our need to share data because we've got different platforms to communicate on so i think it's it, it, it's a really interesting and it's again to the it's it, it's the behavioral model in terms of what's the need and incentives of the individuals and, and what are the cultural needs and how how can we make their lives better right um and i think potentially that might be where adoption comes for ssi it might not be in in developed countries it might be in developing countries where the need for infrastructure systems is greater and so that's why is one of the projects we're moving on in terms of we are looking at potentially doing healthcare worker identity in in resource resource poor countries and then hopefully facilitating people who don't get births registered or don't have identity themselves and how we can create a community there wonderful that's a great way to i think to to finish off and thank you so much manny thank you everyone who joined us today and um, this will be available very soon um, the recording and on, on on the blog post we posted with the video and the slides and um, a slide share presentation too. Um, uh, for anyone who wants to join our upcoming webinars, please sign up to the Telegram group, Twitter, Facebook, and all these other channels we have um, to communicate, or the newsletter especially. And there you can find um, that the upcoming one will be the 26th of February, where we will have Daryl Donald talking about wallets. Um, he has been writing, Daryl has been writing a report about identity wallets for, for a long time. This is very detailed. And um, and I think this will be one of the first presentations about that report that he has been doing in collaboration with some other people in the Canadian ecosystem. And that will be our next upcoming SSI meetup. Manny, it was great hearing from you and learning about it, especially your passion about how healthcare will improve the lives of people around the world. And um, thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to talk with you in the future again when you, when you when you have more progress and more ideas about how this will evolve in the space. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, my pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.